Well, hello, Church One. It is great to be with you once again. Uh, we continue in this three-week series called Learning to Pray. The readings from the lectionary had a lot to do with prayer, and I thought it would make for a nice little three-week series, and that's what we've been doing. But I also think it's important to talk about prayer because, as I've said each week, one of the big mistakes I think we make with prayer is we assume that it's easy and that when we're not doing it enough or not doing it well, we think something's wrong with us. But the truth is prayer is not easy. And we've been talking about that. One of the reasons prayer is not easy is that it's, com- it's communication. It's a form of communication, communicating to God. And for most of us, communication, uh, real effective communication is not an easy thing to do. It often takes disciplines and focuses that don't um, come natural to us. Uh, The first week in the series, we talked about gratitude and the significance of gratitude and cultivating an attitude of gratitude and how that helps us communicate. Last week, we talked about our worries and how easy it is to get lost in our worries and how difficult it is to communicate with God through our worries. But we challenged, I, we challenged you to learn to pray your worries. This week, we're going to talk about another reason why prayer is hard beyond the communication framework. Another reason that prayer is hard is that, frankly, it doesn't seem to work all that well. Most of us, I think, uh, get discouraged in prayer because we pray for things and it doesn't seem to happen I'm taking a class on trauma, and um, one of the things they talk about with children and trauma is that one of the most spiritually traumatic things that happens to a child are unanswered prayers because they simply come into prayer believing God is God and you know they have these needs and desires. They want really good things like someone to be healthy and healed or a marriage to stay together or whatever. They pray about it, it doesn't happen, and it discourages them. And it creates, you know, unanswered prayer is a, is a real thing. And it is very difficult uh, to deal with that. And one of the ways that we need to learn to deal with prayer, unanswered prayer, is the topic of today's message, which is persistence. That one of the things that prayer requires is persistence. It's not as simple as just always saying it and getting exactly what you want the the time that you say it. But to real prayer often, not always, but often requires persistence. And that's not an easy thing to have. And so I want to look at a passage this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18. And in Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable. And it's clear why he's telling the parable. It says it right there. He's telling this parable to teach us to persist in our prayers. The par- what the parable uh, says is kind of clear. What, what's confusing is kind of the, the imagery of the parable. And so I'm going to read it. And I'm going to pray for us. And then I'm going to talk about ways to sort of make sense or understand the message of this parable. And we're going to do that by looking at two, the two main characters and the one main question. So let me read it. Luke chapter 18, 1 to 8, New Living Translation. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So there it is. That's what this is about, ultimately. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find who have faith? Let me pray. Lord, this is your word. 
And then this is a word um, given to us to teach us to persist in our prayers. And that is a difficult thing to do, Lord. In fact, impossible, absent your spirit. And so I pray that your spirit uh, would take these words and make them come alive in our hearts, make them uh, have the capacity to reflect on our own unanswered prayers, our own discour spiritual discouragement. And Lord, may you use your word to encourage our hearts today and enable us to persist in praying. Amen. So again, we're going to try to make sense of this seemingly strange parable, and we're going to be doing, doing it by looking again at two characters and one question. And remember, this is a parable. It's a story. It didn't actually happen. So we really are meant to kind of pull it apart and see the purposes behind the characters. And there's two main characters, there's really two, only two characters in this parable. The first character is a judge. You know, in a certain town, you know, like it's kind of small town judge. And here's the thing about judges. They have, uh, especially in any jurisdiction, right? They have uh, tremendous authority, right? Have you ever had to come before a judge? If you do, you realize like, wow, they have the authority to decide this situation. They're given the capacity to judge. And to judge takes great power and authority. So here is a, a small town judge uh, who's, you know, a powerful man in his community. But what's interesting about this particular judge is that he has, in a sense, unchecked power. The reason I say that is because in the parable, it notes two things about this judge's character. He neither fears man or God. Now, if you think of someone that has sort of governing authority over you, that they actually have the power and you don't, what are the only things seemingly that can keep that power in check, short of revolution or whatever? The only things that can keep that power in check are a fear of people, what they think, what might happen to them if the, you know, they don't treat the people rightly, or a fear of God, an honest recognition that they will have to face God one day. And even if they don't fear people, or even if they're not worried about what people can do to them, they live with the realization that they will have to face God and God will judge them for their actions. And that fear of God can often be a healthy motivator to do the right thing. But this particular judge had completely unchecked power. He didn't fear God, he didn't fear people. He just did whatever he wanted. He was an unprincipled man. It is interesting just to pause for a second, a little sermon within a sermon. But you know, what happens in a world where people stop fearing God? You know, it kind of sounds trite these days to talk about the fear of God or to consider that God will one day judge all of us for our actions and how we live. Instead, it seems like the way of the modern world is to assert and gain and can take power and use it for whatever you desire, whatever you need, whatever your ends are. But what if we have to one day face God? What if God will call us to account for the actions that we've lived? What does it mean to fear God, right? And, and, and fearing God can actually be a great check on abuse of power. And in a world where we so quickly eliminate the fear of God as any motivating factor, maybe we should stop and pause a little bit. That maybe a little bit of fear of God would uh, really be helpful sometimes in our modern day world. But this, whatever you think about that, this is a bad man. He's a bad man. He, he's he got power, it's unchecked. He does what he wants, he's unprincipled. Even when, he, even when the outcome is good, even when he gives the widow her request, he doesn't do it for any principled reason. He doesn't do it because, wow, this is the right thing to do and this poor widow is being abused and I've got power to help her, so let me step in. He doesn't even care about that. The only reason he grants her request is because he's sick of her wearing him out, right? Her persistence drove him nuts and so he acted. 
I don't know about you, but as a father, sometimes my kids have learned the art of persistence and my unprincipled responses. Sometimes I think they know that if they keep wearing me out, they'll get what they want, even if I'm not giving it to them for any principled reason. And that's kind of the way this judge was. He acted, but he didn't act out of principle. He acted because of the widow's persistence. What's his role in the story? It's kind of an interesting you know, thing to think about. Well, why, why did Jesus tell this parable this way? Well, the role of the judge in this story is to act as a contrast. He's the opposite of what God is like. God is a just judge. And not only is God a just judge, God acts for principled reasons. And not only does God act for principled reasons, he acts quickly, Jesus says. Now that's gonna be interesting. I know we're gonna talk about that in a second. But God acts, he responds to our requests. Unlike this unjust judge who was unprincipled and didn't care and only responded because of the widow's persistence, God is different. Jesus says, how different is God than this judge? And, and, and so why do we think that our, when, when he, why do we think he's not hearing us basically is what Jesus is saying. We think he's not hearing us, but why do we think that? He's not like an unjust judge who doesn't hear us. And so this particular judge in this story is here as a contrast. And it causes us to reflect and think about what do we really believe about God when our prayers are not immediately answered? Do we think of God as kind of an unjust judge that we doesn't care about us and it's only our persistence can, that can get what, get what we want? Now, the second character in this story is the widow. The widow is the opposite of the judge in so many ways. A widow, especially in that society, but almost any society really, is, is fairly powerless. They don't have the social power and status to kind of make the wheels of justice move for them. And so they often get ground down and broken by the systems of this world. That seems to be the case for this widow. She's being denied justice somehow and, and the wheels of justice are not turning in her favor. She's angry about it. She's crying out to this judge, you know, give me justice. And she just keeps coming back. There's a great phrase in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, when people show up for a meeting, you know, the, the people welcome them and say, keep coming back, right? There's something about persistence. If you want something bad enough, right, you keep coming back. You know, in AA, if you want sobriety bad enough, you'll keep coming back. You know, this widow wanted justice, so she kept coming back. She was persistent. Think about how painful it is to be denied justice. I'm sure all of us can consider for you know, certain moments where we don't feel like we were heard, understood, given our proper value or worth. I've told you before that like um, government bureaucracies and um, call, you know, having to call in customer service places that don't respond to my needs. This like, tri I'm normally a nice guy, but they trigger this anger in me, right? And I, I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm righteous or anything like this widow. I'm just trying to say that that modicum of feeling like I'm being denied my justice just brings this like anger out in me, right? This, this fight kind of instinct. And this widow is sort of recognizing that. She's being denied something so central to who she is. And she, she, you know, keeps coming back. And it's interesting because I think she realizes something. She realizes that even though the dynamic appears that she's powerless, she's discovered her one power. And her one power is persistence the capacity to keep coming back, the capacity to keep pursuing what you want in spite of the odds, in spite of the failure, in spite of the frustrations. Persistence is a powerful force. Martin Luther, Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech is such a great um, 
anthem of persistence, of, of, of people being denied justice in our society and the call to keep coming back. I have a dream, I have a dream of where we're heading. Persistence is profound personal power. How's that for a tongue twister? Persistence is profound personal power. Um, just last week, Steve Song, who's a member of our church, his father passed away. And in the eulogies, uh, his all of his children got up and spoke. They were really amazing eulogies. And Steve's dad was a an immigrant to this country and uh, ended up raising four kids to go on and, and, and be successful and be educated and all that stuff. And he, he showed a life of great persistence, but one of his daughters told a story in the eulogy of how at one point in Steve's dad's life, uh, Mr. Song's life, he was at a particularly low point and he found himself by a lake. And on this lake, there was one red lotus flower, this one solo flower. And according to his daughter, he said to himself, if that one flower can keep existing here, then there is a plan and a destiny for me that I must pursue. And that one flower, that image of that one lotus flower was a great image of his persistence. And he ends up, you know, rising up as an orphan, uh, coming to America, raising children. It's a powerful story, but, but that one of the driving forces is persistence, right? persistence. And so why, what is this widow in the story about? She's not like the judge. She's not a contrast, right? She's a model. She's a model for what we should be like. A model for us, like the parable begins with, to continue to persist in prayer, even when we don't get what we want. She's desperate, but she still believes, even in spite of seeming indifference. She's a model. And how do we know she's a model? Because my last point, the question, right? This parable is kind of an interesting parable because it ends with a question from Jesus. And the question is this, you know, when I return, will I find this kind of faith on earth? Will I find people that are persisting in prayer, that continue to believe, even when it doesn't seem like anything is happening? Will he? Well, let's take a look at what persistence in prayer can teach us from this parable. The first thing is this. It's very interesting how Jesus, like I said, the judge, the unjust judge is a contrast to God. And one of the things that Jesus says is that, that God is good, right? He's principled and he's also not slow that he is actually acting on our requests, particularly our requests when we feel denied justice or those requests that come from a place where we think God doesn't see us and God doesn't care. No, in fact, God is at work. And, he, and I think he uses this, this case of seeming injustice to help us see one of the deeper things that happens when we persist. You see, this woman is crying out for justice. What is justice? Justice is when a price that is owed gets paid. And there's kind of an interesting, you know, kind of contrast or whatever being done in this, this, this parable. There's the, the tension of the particular versus the universal, right? This woman is, has a particular demand for justice. But just getting one particular demand for justice might work out for this woman individually in this story, but the real ultimate answer for injustice is ultimate justice. And so in a sense, it's good to step back and see that God is not only con con concerned about our personal justice, but he's concerned about ultimate justice. And if justice is about who gets paid the debt that is owed, right? That's the question. It's not only the particular question in this, in this widow's story, it is the ultimate question when it comes to justice. Who gets paid, right? Here's how you wanna think about it. In our crying out for justice, in all the ways that we feel like, you know, the indifferent world is wounding us and we're being hurt and denied, and we may very well be, we probably are. 
If God eliminated all sources of injustice tonight at midnight, how many of you would be confident that you would be around at 1201? See, you are part of the system. You are part of the unjust system. And so what Jesus needs to bring and bring quickly is a, is a way to pay the price for justice without crushing us first. And that's exactly what he does. You see, this widow had forces aligned against her that were gonna crush her, forces of power and injustice and all of this stuff. Jesus gets crushed, right? by those very forces. He's crushed by the Romans, by the religious leadership, by the culture, by the people at large. He's crushed by them, crushed to the point of death. He didn't deserve it, he didn't owe any penalty, but he paid the price. And in paying the price, he made justice possible because he made the way for us to receive mercy instead of justice. He paid the price so that we don't have to pay it. And so Jesus is not slow about pursuing justice. God is in fact not holding back at all in moving the world towards justice, although it appears slow on our behalf and it is often difficult for us to realize it. But God is, as he said, he's not slow, he's acting. You may feel like you're crying out and you're not getting it and, and maybe in your particular you aren't, but Jesus step back is universally bringing something about right now when we persist, right? When we persist, we learn these things because persistence always helps us learn. How many of you, when you're trying to figure out how to do a job and you don't really know how to do it and you, you keep persisting in doing it, you realize there are aspects and elements to it that you never previously understood. In the same way, right? As we persist in our prayers, we learn aspects and characters of the workings of God that we would miss otherwise. So this woman teaches us about persistence in that way, but there's a second thing, is that persistence prepares the heart to receive. Let me ask you a question. Would you really be happy getting what you want whenever you want it? Does that actually work? It sure doesn't seem to. Seem to. I guarantee if you went on Netflix or any other streaming service today, you'd, you'd find a number of stories about the empty lives of the rich and famous. They're all out there, like people that seem to kind of have the world at their fingers and can get whatever they want. But the longer you watch the show and the longer you see the, their lives, the more you're apt to be like, I actually wouldn't take that life that there's something empty about just getting whatever you want whenever you want it, something that stunts the human character. You know, I was thinking about persistence and the way Augustine says persistence heart to receive it. Sometimes not getting what I, we want prepares our hearts to receive something even deeper and more powerful. Sometimes we need to persist so that we're actually ready to receive the gift that we're asking for. I was uh, thinking in November and most of December, there are probably fewer spontaneous gifts given to children in those two windows than any other time of year. Why are there fewer spontaneous gifts given to children in, no, in that kind of time frame? Because you wanna save it for Christmas morning. You want the kids to persist in their hunger for the gift to actually like prepare their heart to receive the gift when it is finally offered to them. In some ways, as we persist, right, we're actually preparing our hearts to receive. So this story of persistence is sort of brought to life by two characters, one a contrast, the judge, one a model, the widow, and a question. Will Jesus find this kind of persistent prayer when he returns? And so I wanna conclude by just doing that. How do we learn to per persist in prayer? You know what, the answer is actually simple. Keep asking, keep showing up. 
Keep asking God. There are probably, I guarantee you, there are places that you want a persistent prayer. Places where, like I said, if in the beginning, prayer doesn't always seem to work. Just this week, I, I, I prayed for two things that I just really wanted and I didn't get. And I'm frustrated. But you know what? I, I, I want to learn how to keep persisting in prayer. And I bet you do too. And so what do you need to do to persist in prayer? Like keep asking, but you know, sometimes, like I said, we're, we're learning to pray. So we always want to end with exercises, right? Let me give you like a simple exercise and it's based on Revelation 5, 8. In Revelations 5, 8, there's a, there's a bowl of incest before the throne of God. It's, it's this imagery of this bowl of in, incense kind of bringing smoke up to the throne of God. And it says that that bowl of incest, incense <laughs> is the prayers of the saints. And it's interesting because elsewhere in Revelations, when the saints show up, one of the main questions the saints are asking to God is how long, God? Like, how long? When will you come back? When will you bring the justice and the, 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 the righteousness that we desire so desperately? How long? And, and then the, you know, Revelation says this is, this, these prayers are like incense to the throne of God. I thought maybe a good exercise that you could do is to take right down, maybe on a couple, a piece of paper, just several unanswered prayers, long, lingering, unanswered prayers to God. Just write them down in all honesty, just whatever it is, be as direct and as candid as you can be. Take it, write it down, and then burn it. Now do it in a safe way, don't burn your house down, all right? But just burn it and watch that smoke come up and consider that smoke as sort of like incense to the throne of God and your way of just subtly keeping coming back like this widow, persisting in your prayers. Prayer is hard work, right? Because prayer is communication. Communication is hard. We talked about gratitude. We talked about worry. But another reason prayer is hard work is because it doesn't seem to work that often. And when we encounter it not working, the virtue of persistence can really be helped, but we gotta learn it. And the only way you learn it is by doing it. God bless you this week. May God hear your unanswered prayers. Thanks.